The power of a human being is that we can take whatever happens to us and change our perception of it. Each time I present the breakthrough experience, very commonly I have attendees want to tell stories about their childhood, challenges that they had. Sometimes people will say that, you know, I was not wanted or I was, they wished I was a boy or a girl, the opposite sex, or maybe some different sex. Um, sometimes they think, well, my mom was not there for me or my dad wasn't there for me or there was aggressive or too passive or didn't, they ignored me or didn't want to put any attention to me. I mean, people come up with all kinds of reasons why they thought that they were having an imperfect childhood. <clears throat> so today I'd like to unveil maybe the perfection inside your imperfect childhood and discuss that. Because I see that in almost every week when people come to the Breakthrough Experience, they, they start out that way. And then we go through what I call the Demartini Method and we ask a new set of questions and make them aware of things that they hadn't been aware of at the end, they have tears of gratitude for what happened. So I'm going to make a statement here that might shock some people initially. But everything that goes on in your life is perceived through your filter. So if you have an, an expectation that people are always supposed to be nice and never mean, when they're mean, you're going to think that you're abused. Or if you have an expectation that people are supposed to listen to you and you're supposed to be important, if they're not, they're ignoring you, you're going to feel ignored. <clears throat> so your expectations have a lot to do with what you project onto your reality. And I'm of the opinion that whatever is happening in your life, it can be perceived in the way and you can become a victim of history or on the way and become a master of destiny. And I've been doing... Uh, helping people transform their perceptions for decades. And I'm certain I've yet to see something that people have been through in their childhood that they can't turn into an opportunity and be thankful for. Anything you can't say thank you for is baggage. Anything you can't say thank you for is fuel. I had a boy who was abandoned um, in his mind from a foster family and before that he was an orphan and his parents both died so he grew up thinking that he was you know rejected unwanted etc and so he had been going to various therapists and specialists and foster family trainings and things but most of his life until 21 was the idea that I was an unwanted child. And that was the story he was running. And people like to share their story that way, their victim story, <clears throat> because they somehow get sympathy and attention sometimes from it. So I um, was asked to work with this boy. And I said, so you, you, your parents died, you were put into an orphanage, and then you got into a foster care, and you got rejected by the first family, and you got into the second family. Yeah, I've been unwanted all my life. That's the story you're in. And I said, okay, maybe. But do you know how to use the Internet? He goes, yeah. You have a phone? Yeah. Let's go online. <clears throat> and I said, pardon me. <clears throat> I said, go to and look up famous celebrities that started out as orphans or foster care. And we started looking things up, started looking at famous names. Sir Isaac Newton. His father died when he was born. His mother then left him for a while trying to find a man, left him with a guy that had an apothecary kind of place. And, um, and I made a list, I showed him a list of famous people that did extraordinary things on the planet. And there were hundreds of these names. It wasn't just a couple. It was hundreds. Famous people that started out as orphans or abandoned or, you know, fostered or whatever. And when he saw that list, I said, these are all the most impactful and powerful people on the planet. They made a difference in the world. You come from the same source as these people. 
And he looked at that and his, he framed his mind differently. And he says, so what you're saying is that I have a special background. I said, you have the background of these individuals that went on to do something extraordinary. Are you sure this isn't a gift instead of a, a blaming setback? And so we can take, and the, the, the power of a human being is that we can take whatever happens to us and change our perception of it. William James, the father of modern psychology, says that the greatest discovery of his generation is that human beings can alter their lives by altering their perceptions and attitudes of mind. Now, I've been doing in the breakthrough experience for decades now, um, taking people who've been through whatever they imagine is terrible and finding out how it served them. They never asked that question. They just assumed with the moral hypocrisies that that event was terrible. And they never stopped to look at what might have been the blessing that came out of it or how they could initiate incredible things. So when I all of a sudden I asked them to go and look for the benefits, they go, well, I don't see any. I said, look again. I can't think of any. Look again. Because you stop looking. Because there's always two sides to it. And people will argue and say, well, what about this? And I go, yep, that too. What's the benefit of that? And all of a sudden people discover some upsides to it, creativities out of it. They develop skills out of it, uh, new angles, new perceptions, new drives. I mean, I'm amazed at what some people will uncover if they ask the question, how is whatever is happening on the way, not in the way? How is it helping you do what's most important to you in your life? How is it helping you do something extraordinary? And if we ask, see, the quality of our life is based on the quality of the questions. If we ask questions that way, we will see that what we thought was imperfection will have a hidden order to it and a magnificence to it if we look. The difference between disorder and order is missing information is called disorder. And when you discover that information, it's order. <clears throat> so by taking the time to find out the other side of the equation and to balance the equation liberates us from the story of the imperfection. I had a lady who was in Florida and um, she had again been abandoned in her mind and she felt rejected and she went to a foster parent. <clears throat> when they did, the foster parents were busy, but they cared about her, but she perceived that she missed out on a mother, that her mother abandoned her. And that's the story she ran. She felt that she was unworthy and rejected. Okay, so I asked her a simple question. Let's make a list of all of the particular traits you think your mother didn't give you because she was gone and she rejected you. Let's write all the things down. And she wrote down about a dozen things that she thought she missed out on. The nurturing, the caring, the in guidance, and this kind of stuff. <clears throat> and then I took each one of those things she thought she missed and I said, so who provided that particular behavior? It's not missing. Nothing's missing. Where is it? And she goes, huh, my mom's sister, her, my aunt, I guess, took on some of that. And my grandmother took some of it. And my best friend's mother took some of it as I got a little older. And then one of my teachers took on of it. And I said, so is the quantity that you would have, you thought you would have gotten from your mother that you thought you missed out on, can you see these other people took on that trait? Yes, I do. I said, can you see that you didn't lose it, you didn't miss out on it, it was just in a diversified form. It was not one, it was many people, but you had all the, the things you wanted from your mom. She goes, yes. <clears throat> I never saw that. So if you take the thing you think you missed out on and find out who provided it, and hold yourself accountable to look, and I've been doing that for decades now, I assure you nothing's missing. It's in a form that you just didn't honor because you had a fantasy about how it was supposed to be and you're not honoring the way it is. And whenever you compare your current reality to a fantasy, you won't appreciate your reality. So I went through all of those 12 items that she thought she missed out on and we accounted for every one of them until it was 100% accounted until she believed that the quantity was equal to what she expected from her mom. And that was eye-opening because she realized, so what you're saying is that I didn't really miss out on that. I said, no, nothing was missing. Missing information is called disorder. And when you see the information, you realize there was a hidden order to it. And then I said, so you're assuming that if your mom had given it to you, it would have been better. 
But if your mom had given it to you, what would have been the drawback? And she just froze. She said, well, there wouldn't be any drawback if my mom had given it to me. I said, no, no, no. Everybody thinks it's a greener pasture on the other side. I had people that come to the break to experience and they, they say, well, my mother smothered me. And then other people that think they, my mother was never there for me. And each one thought the other one had a better deal. And they don't because each of them have both positives and negatives, things you like and dislike. But if you have a fantasy that the other would have been all positive, then you will not appreciate your current reality because you're comparing it to a fantasy. So what would be the downside if your mom had been there? And when she did that, she froze. And she froze and she all of a sudden got teary eyed. And she goes and shook a bit. And I said, what is it? And she said, something my aunt said to me when I was really young. I just remembered it. I said, what is it? She goes, my aunt said that the reason why my mom wasn't there, I didn't believe it and didn't make sense and didn't want to believe it at the time. But she said, the reason why your mom wasn't there is because she left you in a tub with really hot water and got, she had bipolar condition and she left me in a tub and I almost drowned to death and burned to death in the boiling water, the hot water. And the mother said to her sister, I am not capable of raising this beautiful child. It's not fair to her to have me. And all of a sudden her anger towards her mother shifted and she realized her mother cared and loved her and made sure she got what she was wanting for her through other people who were more competent because she felt that she's unreliable and could leave her ch child unprotected. <clears throat> so she didn't leave because of rejection. She left because she cared. And when she got that, she cried and she goes, oh my God, I can't believe that I just completely ignored that and ran the scenario in story so I could be the victim and then get sympathy from people. But when I stop and think about it, my mom really cared and was there for me. And she gave me an opportunity. I said, what's the benefit of these other women taking these roles? And she said, I learned a different language. I got opportunities in education I wouldn't have gotten. And the foster parents went, would, did extraordinary things for me. Even though I punished them, they gave me opportunities I would never have gotten by my mother's. No way. She was not, she didn't have the income. She didn't have the lifestyle. I can't believe that I've fabricated this fantasy about my mom. The real truth is she would not have been able to provide some of these things and she made sure that she gave me a better deal. And in that moment, the perception of her childhood shifted from unwanted to I'm special, from I'm not worthy to I have something special to do and I want to make sure my mom's effort wasn't gone in, in, in waste. And she shifted that day and started to put focus on doing something extraordinary. Now, during the time she felt unwanted and not worthy, she didn't believe that she deserved a great guy. So she was hanging out with guys that would take advantage of her. And she was in low socioeconomic positions. Her perception of herself was compared to a fantasy she was holding on to. And she created partly a fabricated story and th th here's something that she made. And then she realized that if you ask a different set of questions and become cognizant, you'll see things from a different perspective. I saw that same thing in a boy in Australia who was supposedly abandoned, but it turned out that his mother came from Mumbai and lived in a slum and deserved, he believed, she believed that he deserved a better life than what they could offer. And his life changed at age 21, it changed his life also, just like this lady. So it's not what happens to you, it's your perception, decisions, and actions from it. And you can take anything that's ever happened to you and you can find the upsides to it. I do it every week working with people. And every time I do the breakthrough experience, every single time I do it, I'm helping people transform the story that they've run in their life, the childhood victim story, into a victor story. And to find out how whatever's happened is on the way, not in the way. And a lot of people will run that story because it's been convenient. They, they, they've leveraged it with unconscious motives to hold on to the story instead of actually going and, and transforming it into an opportunity and doing something extraordinary with their life. We all want to make a difference. And some people think they're going to make a difference by getting sympathy and play small and, 
and, and use that as their excuse. But I assure you, that's not where the most empowered self-worth comes from. It's from doing something that makes a difference in people's lives. If you ask people, when have you had the most fulfilling moments in life? It's usually when you're doing something that's a service that contributes to somebody else's life that's meaningful to someone. And they say, thank you. And there's been a sustainable fair exchange. <clears throat> so I've seen people who have been beaten. I had a, a, a gentleman who was in Los Angeles, <clears throat> a really shut down guy. And he was basically uh, not really wanting to interact with people, but he attended the program. Somebody told him to come to my Breakthrough Experience program. And what was interesting is he was just very quiet and he really didn't want to participate. He just sat and wanted to spectate. And so I kind of got in his face in a bit. And I said, all right, so who are you having a big resentment to? Because we had one of the exercises was to identify who you resent the most and show you how to dissolve that. So you're living beyond so-called forgiveness, but to actually be thankful. He says, well, my father was um, absolutely violent. He used to hit me with baseball bats and I used to have to hide under the bed and, and surround myself with pillows because he beat me because when my mom died, he expected me to do everything that the mother did, cook and clean and chop and everything else. And I had to cook for him and clean the house and everything else. And I started that when I was four. And if I didn't do everything I was told, I was beaten by a, with a baseball bat or hit and slugged. And I said, great, okay, so let's say that's happened. I'm not negating that, but let's find out how it served you. Well, there's no service to that. How can you say that to a man? He's cruel, he's mean, he's this and she, he wanted to label this guy. And I said, and I spent quite a bit of time and well, some of my facilitators who have been trained in my work also tried to help this guy, but he really wanted to hold on to his story. And then I asked him something that was, I can't say it was, you know, well thought out genius idea. It just happened to come to me. I said, so what do you do for a living? And he said, I am an animator for Disney. I make all of the children's animations for all the movies. And I just got this intuitive chill in my spine. I said, hmm. So just out of curiosity, when you were sitting under your bunk bed, in order to dissociate from the so-called trauma and the challenge that your father gave you, did you use a creative imagination and did you create another world? And he looked at me and he stared and he said, it's exactly where it came from. And I said, did you thank your father? And he goes, no. I said, is that one of the most meaningful things you do to make a difference in children's lives? He said, that's what I live for. I said, did you ever thank your father because you would not have had the creative talent and skill if it hadn't have been for being under the bed and used your creative mind as a survival strategy? He saw that and he said, he said, I never saw the connection. Wow. I said, you sure that this wasn't on the way for your mission in life? I mean, why not see it that way? And he closed his eyes and I said, what do you want to tell your father? And he says, I had no idea. I said, I had no idea you were preparing me for what I absolutely love to do today. I'm one of the most successful animators in the world because of you. And he opened his heart and saw the perfection. Then I asked him a question. At the moment your father was beating you, who is over protecting you? And he said, nobody. I said, they don't have to be in the room, but who's trying to protect you? And he goes, oh, wow. There's a lady next door who knew what was happening in our house and she was frightened of my dad, but she would always come when dad would leave. She'd come over and help us clean up the house or clean up the place and help cook and stuff. And she didn't want me to ever tell him that, but she helped out. She was the overprotector and trying to keep me safe. I said, whenever you have an overprotector and trying to keep you safe and keep you an innocent little child, you usually get somebody that kicks your butt to make you grow up. Because you must have, and maximum growth and development occurs at the border of support and challenge. And if you get over protection, you get aggression. You get over, you know, support, you get challenge. You get over ease, you get difficulty. Whatever you seek that makes you juvenilely dependent, that may become dependent on, you attract the opposite to make sure you grow. So your father did everything he could to make you an entrepreneur and to grow and to do something independent. And he says, well, I did become independent young and I did go on my own. I said, exactly. He said, I've never perceived my father in the light that I have just seen now. I've always seen him as a monster. I've always wanted to just, you know, spit on him almost. But right now, I just want to give him a hug and, and tell him, thank you. I love you. Now, this is my observation. Deep inside almost every child is a part that wants to love the parents. And deep inside of the parents is a part that wants to love the child. 
but sometimes we don't know the skills or we don't know how to communicate and we get self-righteous with our amygdala and expect others to live in our values and we have unrealistic expectations and we don't know how to communicate effectively so we go to gesture and if we don't get gesture of doing it we eventually get to aggression and we end up doing outrageous things with people because we haven't governed ourselves. And that's primarily because we haven't asked the question is to see the hidden order in the parent, the parent chaos. And once we do, we realize that the child we had, childhood we had was not an imperfection, but it was actually giving us the exact ingredients needed to do something extraordinary with our life. I had a girl that was having sex with her father for many, many years. And I said, well, what was the benefits of that? And she goes, well, there's no benefits of that. And I said, well, what were the benefits of that? And she said, well, I, I realized I had control over men. I said, how have you used that? Well, I have gotten places as a result of that. Great. And what do you do for a living today? And she says, well, I'm a nurse. I said, do you have control over men? And she said, that's most of my patients. <laughs> I said, I said Let, we started to look at some of the other sides. Now, am I saying that these behaviors are good? No, I'm just saying they're events. And sometimes people get in, trapped in these moral boxes about this is good and bad and then anything they label good they fear the loss of anything they label bad they fear the gain of and they're trapped and it's almost like a survival mentality instead of seeing that there's two sides to every event in life and everything has a place if it didn't have a place in the evolution of human beings it would have gone extinct so it must serve a purpose the question is, is what's the purpose just because the average psychologist or or philosopher or thinker hasn't figured it out doesn't mean it doesn't have an upside to it because I've helped people find the upside and when they find the upside they all of a sudden liberated from that experience and they realize that there's two sides to every event in their life and they can transform their life the moment they have that realization so all I can say is that that if we take the time to equilibrate our mind and ask the questions to help us see both sides we don't have to be victims of history we can be masters of destiny so right this minute, if you stop and look at the things you thought were terrible in your life, if you look carefully enough, you can find out how it served you. It either developed a skill or it helped you strengthen something or helped you in some way. If you don't see it, well, you'll run the story and stay in a victim of your history and being store it in your subconscious mind and you'll be frightened of things that associate with it and looking for its opposite. You'll be extrinsically run by events that you've chosen to see only one side to. But if you take the time to see both sides and balance the equation, you set yourself free. And then you're not run from external stimuli, you're run from within. And then the voice and the vision on the inside is louder than the, the perceptions on the outside. So I just want to say on, in this message today, unveiling uh, the perfection of the so-called imperfect childhood, that there is maybe more of an order in your childhood than you ever give credit to. If you have had difficulty finding it, please consider coming to the Breakthrough Experience. I love helping people find it. I love helping people unveil what that is, liberate themselves from the illusion that they may keep storing unnecessarily. And if you want to run the story and stay the victim, well, okay, that's fine. You have a choice to do that in life. But deep inside, deep inside, you want out. And deep inside, there's a way out. And that is the questions you ask. And I've been working for years at accumulating the questions on how to do that. So if you'd love to come and join me at the Breakthrough Experience, I'm certain that it can make a difference. I've taken thousands, I mean, literally 120,000 people through who've had those types of stories and had them come out on the other side looking at it differently. People that they've never been able to hug and appreciate, they're finally able to do it, including themselves. Because sometimes the story that you make up, you feel guilty about because you know it's not the whole picture intuitively. And you would like to set yourself free. Come, join me. I assure you that the Demartini method, the method I've developed over the years to ask questions, to help you see things you don't see, become conscious of what you're not conscious of, to make you fully conscious, which is intuitively empowering, I know works. I've seen it. I have too many people to use it and there's thousands of people that I've trained that are using it in thousands of other people's cases. So if you would love to go and liberate yourself and change the story from an unwanted child or a rejected child or a beaten child or abused child or whatever it is, the wounded child, if you want to go and dissolve that, come to the Breakthrough Experience. 
years and years ago, I was doing a, a show with, with a, a gentleman um, that had started the wounded child, the, 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 the what do you call it, the, <clears throat> the dysfunctional family, John Bradshaw. And uh, he was promoting that while he was still playing the victim of his childhood. He later turned out doing some of the same things his father had done, which humbled him. And then he started to realize why his father did that. And he finally made peace with his parents. And uh, he remember we did a show together. And he says, I can't believe what I used to teach years ago that everybody's holding on to about the wounded child. It was my own wounds. And now I don't have that wound. And now I see the magnificence of what happened. And I'm trying to help people see the other side now. I said, well, that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to help people see the other side of the equation and balance the equation. He said, yeah, I couldn't see it. I wanted to play. And then I got a bunch of attention and I got notoriety for playing the victim because everybody wanted to play a victim. But I realized I didn't really help people staying stuck. I helped people by liberating them. And I was inspired to hear that because he had promoted people into the victim world and then turned around later in his life. He, he realized it wasn't the power. It's not where the power is. So if you'd like to unveil the perfection of the so-called imperfect childhood, please consider coming to the break to experience. I know the questions that you will be asking yourself and answering with accountability, because I'll help you do that, will be um, liberating and tear jerking, but not tears of sorrow will turn them into tears of gratitude for the order that's there in your life. And then you'll realize that it's all on the way, not in the way.